We're going to be in the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. If you need a Bible this morning, you can raise your hand. One of our family fam- friendly family members here in red would love to give you one. Best way to follow along is probably on our app. You can download that app if you have a smart device in your app store. Last week we talked about developing a relationship with your Bible. How many of you guys jumped on that reading plan, 21 Days Through John? Very cool. I think uh, I have a group on YouVersion where people jumped into a group with me. Um, you too can do that. If you actually go onto the, your phone on the app right now and you go to the Bible reading plan, uh, you can tap join a group. It says join the plan and right below that it says join a group. If you hit join a group, guess who's the leader of that group? So you're every morning, you're going to be with me in that group, and here's what happens. I read through it. I try to be the first one because I am competitive. So this morning, I was like up at like 5.55. I was reading through everything, and I was like, bam, first to post. So you don't have to be competitive, uh, but it's super fun. You can join the group, and I chime in with some things that stuck out to me, and other people are chiming in. It's a bit of a conversation. It's really cool. So join us. That would be awesome. Today we're going to talk about uh, developing a relationship with your faith. Developing a relationship with your faith. Last week, one of the scriptures that I read was Romans 10, 17. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So consequently, faith comes from what? Hearing the message. So what are we doing in India? We want people to be able to hear the word of God. Now, in this case, because of social status, they aren't able to read because they weren't educated. Bum deal, okay? So we have the ability with our faith to step out and help someone hear the word of God. And when they hear the word of God, upon hearing it, they develop a faith. So it's important that we understand that beyond developing a relationship with our Bible, that what happens next is you begin to develop a relationship with your faith. Today we're going to talk about, and I'm going to be honest about, my struggles and the things that I've walked through, the things that I currently walk through. Is it okay if I'm honest with you? Okay, so I'm going to be honest. I'm going to share some things that I have found that are very helpful for me. You can take those things and you can utilize them if you want. It's up to you. I try to be sure that those things are rooted firmly in this book that we call the Bible that's broken up into 66 smaller books and two different sections. We're going to start out by reading this story in John chapter 4 about this official. John chapter 4, verse 43. Let's go. After two days, he left for Galilee. Who is he? Jesus. After the two days... He left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that the prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for there, or for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who is close to death. Now understand that this man to this point had actually been in the vicinity and has relationship with people that were in the vicinity and he has seen what Jesus is doing. He, he's seen evidence of who Jesus is. He's seen, last week we talked about Jesus is the word. So he has seen the word in action. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, we want to see the word in action. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. He's like, look, my kid's about to die. I'm going to paint the picture for you. You're in a situation where someone who is extremely close to you, a loved one, maybe it's not a child, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a friend, is about to die. And you come to Jesus, you come to this person who you've seen evidence of his goodness. And you're like, would you come with me and would you save this loved one's life? And he starts talking about, well, you know, you're only going to believe if you see. And he's just like, look, would you come with me? You turn to Jesus, would you just come on before it's too late and my loved one dies? Put yourself in these shoes. 
This is not the answer. What I'm about to say, what Jesus said, is not the answer that I'm looking for. And I'm just going to talk, talk to you plainly as a, as a man, as a human, as a person who loves the people around This is not what I'm looking for. He says, the roofer said, sir, come down before my child dies. As Jesus replies, he goes, you may go. Your son will live. It said, that's rather dismissive. Hey, would you just... Jesus, come on, like, you don't understand, he's about to die, and he's like, yeah, yeah, you could go. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> he's going to live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. I'm going to read that again. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. I'm going to read that one more time. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Let me say that again, family. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. Turn to somebody and say, take him at his word. Come on. We got to take him. Family, we got to start taking him at his word. Right? He's not being dismissive. He's like, you could, but you could trust my word. You got to take him at his word. You can depart because everything that needs to be done that you asked for has already been done. You just don't have knowledge of it yet. You can depart now. But Jesus, you don't understand. You get all panicky. <laughs> you ever seen those you know, like dramatic believers? You know what I'm saying? Jesus, oh Jesus. Jesus is like, it's already done. Stop acting dramatic. Jesus is like, listen, Linda. <laughs> the man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized, aha, this was the exact time in which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all can you say all? all? So he and all his household believed. Say they believed. they believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from the Jan Galilee. What we see is probably one of the most beautiful pictures of just flat out obedience and faith. And I'm pressed in my own life. Do I have the faith? If, if, if I was pressed with this sort of circumstance, do I have faith in Jesus that I preach about to you on Sundays? Do I, have, do, I really, do I really possess a faith that Jesus is like, the thing that you're asking for is done? He didn't, he didn't even give the man that much information. He just said, you can go. He's going to live. Do I have that kind of trust and belief? We're going to talk today about faith. Let's define faith first. Faith. I can do a whole series on faith. When, when you start reading about faith, and it gets really like big words, big Christian words, okay? Fill in big Christian words that you're like, what does that mean? Justification and sanctification, like really big words that's like, let's boil it down. Here's what it means. Faith. Trustful human response. Faith is trustful human response. Okay, let me define that really quickly because when you hear that, you're like, wait a minute. Trustful human response means our response, we trust wholeheartedly in our own response. No, our response comes from a trustful nature. We trust so much in this other thing that we respond. Does that make sense? So we have a trustful human response. It also means limited personal knowledge of God. Limited personal knowledge of God. Uh, I understand in my own life, no matter how much I read this one book made up of 66 books broken into two parts, that I'm going to have a limited knowledge of God. There's going to be a day that I'm going to stand before a living God and, and there's going to be an aha moment that the 99 things that we wanted to argue about, I was wrong about. And I'm not worried whether or not you were wrong about the other 99 things. I'm not, I'm not worried about what you were wrong about and I'm wrong about. I'm not worried about what the church is preaching down the street any longer. You know why? Because it was with limited knowledge that I decided to get into the argument. Why? Because I'm human. I'm not God. I don't understand the fullness of who he is. So can I just say as a peripheral issue, can we just stop arguing about who God is? Because you have a limited knowledge of who God is. So do I. What I want for you is a personal 
a personal knowledge. It's limited personal knowledge. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin asking, like, what's your personal knowledge of Jesus? Well, I believe Jesus is, have you experienced that? No? How do you have a personal knowledge? Well, I read it in the book. I've read a lot of things in books that I know, but I don't know. And what God wants is he wants you to have a faith that you don't know here, but you know here and here. Are you with me? It also means, in the English we say, most of the time when we see this word faith, it means to believe. So when you read the Bible and you see that to believe, that's like faith. They believe, they have faith. To believe, but in Greek, it's to faith. To faith. So we replace to faith with to believe. To faith. Now I'm going to talk about some key things that I've, I, in my own life I've seen that have become really important to me. And as I focus on them, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with these at times. Maybe you call it personality. Maybe you call it human nature. I don't know. But I struggle with some of these sometimes. Number one, faith is active. Faith is active. James 2.15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Now just before this, in verse 14, from James 2, 1 through 14, he's talking about, the author is talking about not showing favoritism to people based on what they look like, based on what they drive, based on what political party they're part of, based on how they identify. It's, we're not showing favoritism. This is important for us, especially in society in 2019. We don't show favoritism. Because Jesus came to actually save all. But what happens is we get really caught up in the outward appearance. And so James Simon's like, don't, don't show favoritism. So that's why he says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about it, their physical needs, what good is it? You know how many times in my life it's like, I, I, I'm like, someone comes to me and they're like, Pat, I'm just like, man, I'm like tr- going through a trauma. I'm struggling. This is so difficult. And I'm like, I'm going to pray for you. I'm praying for you. I'm going to go away and I'm going to, I'm just, I'm going to ask God just to give you faith. That person's looking at me. Uh... I'm hungry and naked. I don't know that you need to pray much about that. I'm going to pray God brings you the resource. Well, you, you got a shirt on your back. You have resource. And then we say things like, you know, you just got to have faith person's like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Can I be honest? I feel like, I feel like the Lord is speaking to his, his church. It's his. I get, the, I get the pleasure of actually standing before you in your church that belongs to God, by the way. This is not my church. And I feel like the world right now is like, I want to throat punch you if you tell me to have faith one more time. Because I feel like you have the resource, but you keep telling me you're going to pray and to have faith. But what are you doing? God wants to wake us from our slumber. He wants to wake us from our sleep. Christians in the room. God wants to awaken us. From this weird mindset that we have. The church is what we do when we obtain faith and we come and we sit in a seat. And we wonder why the broken world around us is becoming more broken. And we go, God... We're just praying, we're interceding on behalf of our state in California. We're interceding, we're standing in the gap on behalf of our city that our city would turn 
God's like, um, yeah, you see, the evidence of who I am actually comes through you. Quit asking me. I gave the city you. I gave America you. And we want to run. Listen, we need to pray. But for goodness sake, we need to get up and we need to like exercise our faith. In fact, the rest of the scripture says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good, even the demons believe that and shudder. So faith is believing and obeying Jesus. Faith is believing and obeying. Faith is not just something that we behold. You know, we talk about like, man, I'm going to lose my faith. Like a bottle of water. And we're, we're scared that at one point we're going to get really, really thirsty and we're going to lose our faith. So we hoard the water. And God is saying, no, I want you to have a faith that operates because like there's this living water that flows through you. So you're good. You can actually drink of this water called me and have a faith in me and you can give it away and you will always have a drink. But we hold on to our faith and we see it's something we hold. We become like faith holders. Hoarders. How much can we hoard? I got so much faith. People are like, we're walking around, I got faith. I'm like, nobody knows it. Because you got to store it away in closets and like, you're, a, you're like a faith prepper. You got storage bins buried underneath your backyard full of faith. What the heck are you going to do with all that faith? I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back. Jesus is like, oh. Hey, would you do something with all that stuff that you're hoarding? So that when I come back, the people have heard the message about me? Can I tell you that people hear the message by reading scripture? They hear the message by listening to what I'm saying. But do you know where they hear the message loudest? By your actions. This is convicting for me because I can say that I love somebody, but if my actions don't line up with what I'm saying, I'm a hypocrite. Growing issue right now in 2019 with millennials and Gen Z. You speak of your faith, but we dare not ask to see it. Well, you don't understand, and we want to get real deep about this. We need, we need to get deep in sweat. You need, we need to get deep in dirt. We need to exercise our faith because too many people are running around believing. It says even the demons believed. It's not good enough to believe. Are you with me this morning? So faith is something that we can grab a hold of, okay? And it's also something that we do. It's a noun and a verb. This is important. It's not one or the other. Because this is, this is where sometimes, you know, I talk to people like, you know, faith... Faith is something that, you, that, that God gives us. And I'm like, yeah, but it's something that we do. No, it's something that we obtain. And I'm like, it's, yes, it is something. But once I obtain it, like, it's like buying a blender and then never taking it out of the box and putting it on a shelf and then pulling all the fruit out and going like, why, 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 is it, why isn't all my food blended? It's like, because you obtained something that actually has a purpose, but you're not utilizing that noun as a verb. And your faith is a noun and a verb. And so if you don't take your noun and verb it, <laughs> you, you, you need to verb your noun. I said it first. <laughs> so the official did what? He verbed his noun. He, he gained some belief, but then he had, when, 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 when Jesus said, you need to go, what did he do? 
He took him at his, and he, oh, come on. This man's like, I'm going to verb my noun. So I came up with a new word. It's called, fa- it's called faithing. Faith is when you take the thing you obtain and you actually apply it for what it's purpose for. It's faithing. It's not a real word, but I just made it one. So don't be like, faithing's not a real word, pastor. Look it, it's a, I'm preaching. <laughs> faithing is a real word. So this official was caught, in the, in, caught red-handed in the act of faithing. How often do we get caught in the act of faithing? Or how often do we get caught talking about our faith, but we don't get caught in the act of faithing? We may even get really good at getting caught in the act of like gathering our faith. We show up on Sunday and we're like, woo, got my Jesus on. Like, no, you didn't. The demons believed and knew who Jesus was. <laughs> you, you have to verb that noun. It's called faithing. And how often do you and I get caught in the act of faithing? How often are we, how often could we be accused? Not based on what we know, but based on what we do. Number two, I had to learn this, and this was hard for me. I will say largely because I'm a knucklehead. If you're a self-professed knucklehead, you can just raise your hand with me right now. Self-professed knuckleheads in the room, where you at? All right. No, okay, I had to learn the hard way. It wasn't easy. It still isn't easy because I'm like, my way is a better way. Anybody? I'm like, I'm not listening to my GPS. I'm not listening to my wife. There's a back road to get there. And the GPS and her British voice and my wife and her wonderful voice, I'm not listening to either one. They're like, you should maybe stop and get, I'm like, no, I have a better way. I'm gonna apply, I'm certain that I'm right. And I'm applying that certainty right now. Do you know how often that works out for me? <laughs> Not much. Causes marital disputes. Had to buy like 10 new phones because I just throw that thing right out the window. <laughs> I have an anger issue with my phone. I'm like, this phone is wrong. Google, Apple, everybody, your maps are wrong. They must be because I know what's best. Can anyone relate? All right. Faith has grown. This is tough for me. I'm just I'm being honest. Faith has grown. It's a patience game. Matthew 17, 20, he replied because, this is what he said, Jesus says this, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe for you really quickly what this word, okay, what happens is in this scripture, a lot of times people focus on the mustard seed. I just need faith, I need faith the size of a mustard seed. If I just have more faith than a mustard seed, then I could tell a mountain to move, okay? So here is a bag of mustard seeds. There's one mustard seed. One little seed of mustard. Let's see if I can get, I have square fingers. So, that you can't even see this. You can't see it, can you? I'm holding it between my fingers. It actually looks like I'm not holding anything. See, like that. It doesn't look like I'm holding anything. But in between my fingers is a mustard seed. If you have more faith than that, you can move a mountain. So what we do is we focus on the mustard seed. Right? So this is what we do. I got these things coming up in my life. God... There is a mountain in my life. I'm dealing with some stress, some struggle, some trauma. And we go, I just need faith bigger than a mustard seed. I'm going to throw my faith at this mountain. And we take and we throw our mustard seed at it. Could you guys tell if I threw that mustard seed? I did. But you know, that, that's what happens. Let me describe for you. This scripture is more about the word little. The word little has nothing to do with volume and size, I should say. It doesn't say you need faith that's bigger. 
The word little means lack of frequent and consistent application. Lack of frequent and consistent application. Why does that matter? This is what it's saying. When you want that mountain in your life to move and you need faith, it's going to take some growing. And we hit these moments in our life and we come to the mountain and we go, mountain, move. Take that. And we, we walk away from it. And we think we're good. We turn around, the mountain's still there. And we're like, Pff. God, Scripture's not even true. Faith? I have more faith in me. Stupid thing. I don't even know. I, 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 I doubt God is even real now. And we start experiencing disbelief. But this is what it means. It means that you're going to apply faithing in frequent and consistent manners. I'm going to say, God, I, I at least have a mustard seed worth of faith that you can move mountains in my life. But here's the deal, God. Until I see it happen, mountain move. Mountain move. Mountain move. Mountain move. You know, if you keep doing that long enough, your mustard seeds, your faith will grow and it will become bigger than the mountain. But we fail to be consistent with our application of what little measure God has given us. We treat it like one big effort. God, move in my life. Move in my finances. God, move in this church. God, move in this city. God, change the hearts and transform the lives of the families and the homes that call this place their home. And do we have the ability to show up time and time again faith, and faith, and faith, faith, and faith. Are you getting it this morning? And faith. You see, faith has grown over the time of consistent application of God's word. Faith has grown over a time of consistent application of God's word. Faith is also lost over a time of inconsistent application of God's word. I call faith our spiritual fitness. July 8th, I had been training, did a half Ironman in April. Come to July 8th, I was, pr- I was pretty fit. I was in good shape. Setting myself up for some, a great race coming up in December. I had to have surgery. So I had all this physical fitness that I had built up. From my daily consistent application of getting up in the morning and just taking one step and putting it forward. Can I tell you right now that your faith growing has nothing to do with your ability to be perfect in your application? I said it's your consistency of application. There's mornings that I wake up and I just have a horrible workout. There's mornings I wake up and I, I just, I, I, I'm bad at parenting. There's, there, there, there are weeks that I go and I'm like, am I even like a husband to a wife? Like, what am I thinking? I am doing so poorly at husbanding. I'm preaching, that's my word. Right? Can anyone relate? So it's not the perfection of it, it's the consistency. So July 8th, I have surgery. I'm down for four weeks. I can't work out for four weeks. So I have to pick back up after 
three weeks, I couldn't handle it, so I started doing some exercise. And at four weeks, I started kind of working, and then this last week, a week ago, I really had to like buckle back down to like two workouts a day. Like, you know, I want to throw up. This is really hard. This hurts. This is painful. I'm suffering right now. And I get back into the consistency of it. But this is what happens. I could have gone and said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embark on the consistent application of my physical fitness training. And I could have coasted for a while. Because I could have gotten up in the morning and I could have run, I could have biked, I could have swam, and I could have gone, oh, I feel good. How many of us do that? We like don't read the Bible one day, we don't spend time with God one day, we don't go to church for a week, two, three, four. And we're like, I'm good. And we start looking around and we're like, no lightning, no thunder clouds, I'm alive, I'm not dead. <laughs> hey, I can do this thing on my own. I kind of good. I'm maintaining my faith. Okay, this is good. And then we get into this me mentality where I'm going to coast in my faith. I'm going to coast in my physical fitness. And I could have done that. But here's what happens. There will hit a point. You will coast for a little bit in your spiritual fitness. I can coast for a little bit in my physical fitness. And then the decline will start to show itself. The decline was happening the moment you stopped consistently ap uh, consistently applying so you know but it doesn't show itself depending on how fit you are it doesn't show itself for quite some time but when it shows itself you are very aware and then you're like what the heck is wrong i don't know what's wrong it's like i don't even know jesus and he's like because you don't you haven't spent time with me in three months you've been coasting And there is a trial and there is something coming up in your life. There is a mountain that you're facing that you're going to come up against. And you're going to need that spiritual fitness. For me, December 8th, I'm going to race. I'm going to go out to Palm Springs and I'm going to run myself into the ground 70.3 miles. And I'm going to try to kill myself being better against myself for free. In fact, I'm paying money to suffer. Makes no sense, right? And here's what I've learned. The Bible says that I'm going to suffer in this life no matter what. But do you know what I've learned from doing triathlon? I'd rather suffer at a faster pace. <laughs> do you understand that? See, it takes me four hours and 46 minutes to get through 70.3 miles. And if you don't want to be disciplined about your consistent application, it's going to take you six, seven, eight hours to get through the same race. Why would you want to suffer that long? You're going to suffer either way. Suffer now in the discipline of consistent application or spend twice as long on course, throw up, lose all bodily function. This is real stuff that happens, by the way. Get carted off course by the med, by the med clinic. You know what I mean? They're like, man down, dude in stretchy tights, losing bodily function. That ain't pretty. God is saying, discipline yourself now. He's given you a race to run and a race set before you with endurance. It's not a sprint. Your faith being grown is a marathon. It's one step in front of the other. It's, I'm going to apply consistently today. Oh, today didn't go so well. That's okay. I'm going to get up tomorrow because I'm going to be aggressive in my ability to fail forward. I'm going to get up. It's okay. I'm going to take a step forward tomorrow and then I'm going to keep doing it. And then over, all of a sudden, you're going to hit, okay, I'm going to hit this test and you're like, I can get through this mountain. Why? Because I have these small things of success that have been built up over history. Adam and Eve were inconsistent in their application to trust God. So when the enemy comes and says, hey, are you sure that God said that you can't eat from this tree? This is what's happened. They went, um, we're not certain. So they, be, they, they place their certainty, their belief and their trust in their own self and in a serpent rather than God. When we stop applying our faith consistently, that's when we get into trouble. I just don't know how it happens. I just keep falling back into pornography. I just keep falling back into addiction. No, there's a consistent application. I'm going to get up, and if it's moment, listen, I've been there. This, I'm being honest with you. I've been there. 
And sometimes it's like minute by minute in my life that I'm going to apply my faith. I'm faithing moment by moment. I'm not going to allow what the enemy wants to say about me. I'm going to stick to the promises of God. I'm going to apply the promises of God. Application of your faith. The application of your faith becomes the declaration of what you believe. I believe in Jesus. Then your faith, when you apply what you say you believe, becomes the declaration and when we get stuck up against things, we grab a mustard seed. Can I tell you right now, there's no declaration too small? It says that we only need faith of a mustard seed. These seeds are so small, I was holding one and you couldn't even tell. Do you know that's how small the issue might seem? You may think like, I don't need to go to God for this. And God's like, no, bring it to me. Faith with me today. Put that thing in front of me today. Be consistent in these things. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to hit doubt because we all do. Can I tell you that right now? We all hit moments where we're like, I don't know if I believe. I'm kind of doubting right now. I know there's moments that hits me, but here's, here's the difference. Possibly in my life, what I have is I have such a long history of these small mustard seed moments in my life that I've applied faith that even when cerebrally I go, I don't know if I fully believe what it is that I'm preaching. Like, this is really hard for me to believe, God, that you would do, because it's outside of my idea of what's possible. It seems so impossible to me. And then God reminds me, hey, look at these 2,700 things that I've done in your life. And that gives me the strength because I put one step in front of the other to be able to run the marathon, to be able to press against the mountain. Are you with me this morning? How many of you are facing a mountain this morning? This is life. If you're facing a mountain, it's not because you're, you're a crappy Christian. You're facing a mountain because you're human. You woke up this morning and you're breathing. Amen. Praise God. You now have an opportunity to collaborate and be a partner with God in applying your faith. Man, welcome to the family. This is so good. How can I encourage you today? That's the response. Here's the question in my head that I ask myself, and I save this to last, is why faith? Why? Why even, why even have faith? Matthew 17, 20, the very scripture I just read about a mustard seed, said something in the very end of it that I thought was so powerful. This is a promise, but if you apply your faith, it says nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for me. Nothing will be impossible for us. Nothing. Faith opens our future to the impossible that God can make possible in and through our life. I think God does that by way of when we apply our faith little by little. It changes our perspective as we learn about who God is. As we gain, at best, a limited personal knowledge because neither one of us are ever going to have full knowledge of God because we're human. There's always, can I tell you, there's always going to be a mystery to God. Well, I just don't understand that. You know what the best thing I can say to you? Yeah, me either. That's why God's God. And I'm a knucklehead. And the biggest thing that happens is, is we start shopping with our wallet in God's economy. So we want to see the impossible made possible. So I know as a church, we want to see a move of God. 
We pray for a move of God. God, we want to see you change our city. We want to see you change everything that's happening and going on. And so we go, God, we're, we're praying, right? Can I, can, can I share some, some inside stuff with you? Yeah. Two of you, cool. I'll just tweet it. That would be poor communication. Listen. There are things that God has put on the hearts of our family here. There's things that God has put on my heart as a leader that require resource, that require us functioning as a family in faith to see a move of God. Some of them are physical. So I'm going to give you an example. When I look out these doors and I see our courtyard and I see that dirt lot right there that's like a desert oasis that's brown and full of weeds, that may be your perspective. I feel like I have God's perspective. Because when I look out there, I see a place where community and family can happen. I see a place for us to embrace everything that's going on during the week where our work offices will be. Because right now, we don't have offices. Why? Because we believe God wants to do something. And so we're, we're doing what's necessary on our part. When I look out there, I see something beyond the dead grass, and I go, oh, in that space, it can be landscaped and community can be happening during the week, and there's place for families in the neighborhood to come, and there's places for food to be able to be distributed during the week to the 500 people that came to get fed. And by the way, on Sunday, when I walk out with my family and I cross the court, I can go out there and there's food to be able to be um, given so I can sit down, I can eat a meal and hang out. And there's a volleyball court out there. And there's a workout facility out there. And there's a place where we can creatively get together and we can produce the things creatively to tell the stories, the wonderful, amazing stories that God is doing in our family. Because there's wonderful, amazing, miraculous stories that God is doing in our family. You know that's a hair under a million dollars? Right when I said that just now, you shopped with your wallet. You did. You started 101 things hit your head. And God's like, stop shopping with your wallet. Well, God, I don't have a million dollars. He's like, that's right. That's why you need faith. That's why you need me. You, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Faith is our ability to shop with God's wallet. Because he's like, oh, a million dollars? Like, You guys are like, I'm not going to ask you for a million dollars right now. Everyone relax. People are like. <laughs> Harriet, guard your wallet. What am I presenting to you? I'm presenting to you, you're like, what if you fail? Well, here's what I feel about failure. Aggressive, faith-filled failure is my goal. Aggressive, faith-filled failure is my goal. Why? I would rather fail being aggressive with my faith than remain dead sitting on a seat and not doing anything. That ain't fun in life. God is waking us from our slumber family. He's calling us to a level of audacious faith where we're willing to fail, but we're going to do it in faith. We're going to do it shopping with his wallet. We're going to do it going after women in India who haven't had the opportunity to be educated because of their systems. And we're going to give them the opportunity to hear the word of Jesus so that their faith can be grown and they can be walking in audacious faith themselves. We have the ability to respond. Are you ready today to be caught in the act of faithing? Are you ready today? And it's it's a mustard seed. Well, Pat, what are you asking for? A million dollars? No. 
Just as an example, can I tell you that if it took a million dollars, it's only one dollar at a time. It's the consistent application. But we get focused on the big number. We get focused on the mountain family. Hello. Are you focused on the mountain today? God's saying, I want you to take your eyes off the mountain. Put your eyes on me. I want you to take your mustard seed and not one of them is too small to declare. I want you to begin to apply it and you're going to start your act of faithing. Are you with me? Stand with me this morning. I realized in my life that my life was never going to be defined by by the beliefs that I held. Maybe it's just me, but there's something in me that wants to have a life that has more purpose than what I could ever imagine for myself. I, I want people to stand someday, it could be tomorrow because life has no guarantees, but I want people at least to stand at the day that that comes where I go to meet Jesus and go, well, I'll tell you one thing about Pat. He lived for something that was bigger than himself. He lived for more than just what we see. And it scares me sometimes personally when I look at my own faith and I go, people aren't going to champion or cheer or care. And we're not going to be known by the beliefs that we hold. But by what we do with those beliefs. God wants have a miraculous move through your life. Some of you this morning have been given very clear insight on what God wants to do through your life. And some of you look at it and go, that's impossible. You shop, you, uh, 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 you're shopping with your wallet. You're shopping with your wallet. And I'm going to tell you something. I realized also in my life that if I set a goal or I think that I've got a vision from God that's achievable, then I'm severely underachieving. We need to set things in front of us that we're like, I want you to say, Pat, that's impossible. And I'm going to go, now we're starting to get somewhere. Right? I, I, I want to have that little bit of like trepidation, like, ooh, I don't know if, I don't know if we're going to pull this off. God, I don't know. I guess we're going to have to rely on you. And he's like, Pfft. all right. Number one, have you placed your faith in the hands of Jesus? Simple this morning. Have you placed your hands and your faith in the hands of Jesus? You know that if you're a follower. If you're a believer, awesome. My goal is to help you pick up what it is that you said yes to Jesus and now start to apply it. Are you a follower? What small act of faithing can you begin with today? It's just a mustard seed family. One small thing, what can you do today? Some of you might go, hey, you know what? Like, tell me more about like, what you see in our city and what you think we can be as a church family here in this area. One small, it's a question. What can you do? One small act. What is one audacious faith goal you would like to set? This is something impossible for you to achieve on your own. It's impossible for you to achieve on your own. It's an audacious faith goal. That means you need people around you. You need accountability around you. You need God resource around you. Okay, it's not like, oh, I got it all. I can do it. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, spend time this week asking God what he would like to do in and through your life. Like, really get a sense, God, what do you want to do through my life? Some of you have never asked that question. You've just said, this is what I want out of my life. God's like, you think that's fulfillment? 
but you have a limited personal knowledge. And you don't know what's on the other side of impossible. There's this sea of possible that you've never experienced. But you're fine with just living in this world over here. Spend time with God this week. Let's pray. If you need prayer this morning, if you're struggling with your faith, if you have mountains in front of you, if you feel like that because of the history of your life, where you came from, the zip code you grew up in, who your mom was, who your dad was, who your siblings are, what your education is, what's your ability to understand this one book made up of 66 books split into two parts. If those things are mountains to you and there's this thing inside of you that says you could never be, this could never be true, I want to pray for you this morning. I would ask that you would come forward because God wants to move a mountain in your life. And this morning, the first application of faith is to say, God, I know that I don't have it, but I know that you got it. I know that I want, I want to shop with your wallet this morning, God. I want to shop in your economy. I don't want to shop with my wallet. Because all I got is I got more month than money. I got credit cards that are stressing me out. I got finances I can't get control of. God, I need to make more money. God, would you send me help? And he's like, dude, I'm sending you help. I've given you everything. You have to begin faithing. Father, this morning... If we're facing these mountains, you can move mountains. We thank you this morning. We thank you that you can move mountains in our lives. Bless every person in this room. Not with a cheap token, but with the ability to hear and the ability to obey. That we together can begin faith thing that we can verb our noun we thank you Jesus and everyone said amen and amen